Ovelha. And now what's it For those of you watching, we just enjoy the picture for a second. Okay, we're in chapter 9, picking up in verse 24 tonight of Genesis. Oh, thank you, all right. No, yes. You have to go to the other end of your book on Revelation on Sunday nights and here on the first in Genesis on Wednesday. 9 and 24 of Genesis. Remember, we talked about the fact that after Noah left the ark and the animals left and he became a husband and had a vineyard and as happens so often with vineyards wine it fermented whether or not he knew it was ferment we don't know but he got intoxicated fell, fell asleep or passed out in his tent without any clothing on and one son went in and saw him and went out evidently and told everybody else and his other two sons backed in out of respect for their father and covered him. So as we pick up in verse 24, and it says, And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Uh, evidently, here Noah had awakened from the wine because he from that wine stupor. You know, it happens. It happens today all the time. People drink too much and they'll pass out. And he noticed that his robe had been placed on him. Evidently, he had enough remembrance that this wasn't the way he laid down. So obviously, someone had placed that robe over him. He vaguely remembered, I'm sure, but it, even if he had laid it on him, it wasn't the same way that he left it. So he was very much aware that somebody had been in there. And he must have inquired of his wife, or if she was still living, and maybe his sons, and he learned the whole story. They found, he found out what happened. As ashamed as Noah must have been in his own moral lapse, he realized the sin of Ham was far greater. There was something there. Since it revealed Ham's heart of rebellion and unbelief, not only against his father, but also against his father's God. You know, similarly, the act of uh, Shem and Japheth plainly testifies of both of their respect for their father and their own respect and their faith for the Lord. It's an amazing that you have three sons and two have faith, one doesn't, one has done respect, the others do. So, we're getting ready to look at something here, the Noahic prophecy coming up, you know, with the uh, deepest hearts of his son open right before him. You know, we've said many times, what's in here comes out in your life. Now he has really seen his sons. So Noah is moved to make now in, the, in verses 25 through 27 his great declaration, his prophetic declaration. Some, uh, to some extent, you know, his insight in revealing what's coming in the future was based on what he had seen, probably the character of his sons already. He had seen these, these young men grow up. He knew them. He knew their children. He could foresee the future of their respective courses by the way the father was going to teach his sons. It's still true today. How a father raises his sons, that's the way the son's going to go. If you have a father who doesn't care about taking his son to church, that son's not going to church. But if that son, that father, has a heart for the Lord, and he brings that child up in the Lord, that child's going that direction. As that tree has been, right? And that's what's happening here. He could see this. And he knew that the descendants would probably follow the example of their father. And you know, more importantly, even though he sees all these things, and we can try to explain it naturally, you have to remember this is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is giving Noah utterance of what to say here. He is prophesying by the Spirit, even though he knows his sons well. 
The Holy Spirit knows them better. And the Holy Spirit is now going to give him what to say. And he first of all had to take the proper note of what the younger son had done unto him. You know, some people say this is probable because of the term younger. Uh, it could, and actually here it means youngest. And if you say younger, that just means it's either the second or third son. But it's actually, it means the youngest. So we're talking about uh, Ham here. He was the youngest son. Japheth was the eldest. Uh, you'll find that in 1021. And it's significant as this great prophecy uh, of Genesis 3, 15 through 18 was given as a result of the fall of Adam. This prophecy is given because of the fall of Ham. We have a parallel here of what happens before the flood at creation and the fall of man and after the flood and the fall of, I'm sorry, the fall of Noah. I said Ham, but I didn't know it. Noah has fallen away now because of the wine. And, and the parallel between the two here is pretty striking when you look at it. Both Adam and Noah were commanded to do what? Be fruitful, fill the earth, and exercise control over it. Both were given that command. Each of them is actually the ancestor of every person on earth today. Each sin by partaking of the fruit. In Noah's case, the fruit of the vine. In Adam's case, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The result, you notice ever think about that result? As soon as Adam ate of the tree, what, what happened? They realized he was naked. And Noah's in his tent. What is he? He's naked. And it's a wonderful parallel we have going here. And so, finally, the prophecy resulted in a curse which has affected mankind ever since. The, the sweat, the curse of the ground. And, and although the curse was also a blessing, and it was also anticipation of salvation. Uh, according to Acts 17, 26, God had a specific time and place and purpose for each nation throughout the ages. Again, Acts 17, 26. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Again, we're all one family. Hard to believe, one big family. And although each race and nation were to contribute to the corporate life of mankind as a whole, the overriding purpose of every nation, every nationality, was that they should seek the Lord. That's Acts 17, 27. What is the purpose of man? To seek the Lord. Something which is quickly forgotten. If you go back to the fall in Eden, how long was it? Was it long before man wasn't seeking the Lord? By the time we get to the flood, no one was seeking the Lord. Quickly, we're going to see after the, the flood, and man's supposed to go out all through the earth, they're not seeking the Lord. They go down to battle. It's so easy for man to not seek the Lord anymore. Why are there so many empty seats in churches on Sunday morning? People aren't seeking the Lord. So the basic outline of the function of each of the three major streams of nation is given in this remarkable prophecy of Noah in these verses from 25 to 27. Verse 25 says, And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Noah's prophetic words here are first directed at Ham in the person of his son Canaan. Interesting, isn't it? He puts the curse on the son, actually the youngest son of Ham. And then he talks to Seth and then Jacob, uh, the oldest probably, probably represented the order of which they were from the youngest to oldest we see there. He could uh, gladly pronounce the blessing on his two older sons. And he was happy to do so. But you notice, he can't bring himself to bring the curse on Ham personally. He brings it on his son. In other words, he's putting it on Ham and his descendants here. Here's a father, and it's breaking, you can see it's breaking his heart. Cursed be Canaan. Let's see, he basically said, cursed is Canaan. 
since he, along with his older brothers, had inherited that carnal and materialistic nature of his father Ham. Again, fruit doesn't fall far from the tree. It's been argued from time to time, well, actually, I guess, since man started reading the Bible, if the curse applies to Canaan or to all the descendants of Ham. Well, uh, the difficulty with applying it only to Canaan is basically threefold. The prophecy seems to be intended to be uh, symmetrical and worldwide applying to all of the descendants. If it deals solely with Canaan, it has been fulfilled only sporadically and imperfectly over the years. And the descendants of Canaan, for example, included the Phoenicians <coughs> and the Hittites, which were two of the greatest nations in the uh, in antiquity. And it's true that even these, as well as other Canaanites, eventually became uh, subjugated and destroyed by their enemies. But the same fate also befell the, the, uh, and the descendants of Seth and Japheth. Thirdly, it was the sin of Ham, not Canaan, that caused this curse. That's what caused the occasion. But uh, it would have been inappropriate for Noah to single out just single out, just single out one son. That would seem inappropriate, wouldn't it? Why would he? That son didn't have anything to do with it. So we understand that he's not going to be the one, simply the one bearing the curse. It's the ancestors of Ham. So we have to understand that. Rather than Canaanite curse, with Canaan mentioned specifically, in order to stress the terms of the prophecy, it extended to all of Ham's sons, even his youngest, and down the line. I can understand the father here, not wanting to just say his son. But you have to remember here too, who is inspiring what Noah is saying? The Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has a plan and a purpose. He's God. He has a plan and purpose. So, this is not uh, just a reaction to Noah's hurt. You know, that Noah's youngest son had brought grief to his heart. That's a fact. So he didn't just jump out and jump at hands. You notice that? Usually when something happens, the first thing you want to do is strike at that person. But he doesn't do that. Praise the Lord, the Holy Spirit's inspiring him here and helping him. So assuming the curse did apply to all the Hamites in general, what was the meaning of it and how was it to be fulfilled over the years? A servant of servant shall he be unto his brethren. It can hardly mean slave of slaves because such a situation has never occurred among the descendants of any of Ham's four sons, including Canaan. So what does it mean here? The descendants of Ham included the Egyptians, Ethiopians, and a, a lot of those great nations of the past. And there's a possibility they could include a, a, a great Asiatic nations of present as well. And if we get to looking at what these people are going to produce, you can look at it today and see. Unfortunately, there have been some interpreters who have applied the Hematic uh, curse specifically to the black race, the black people. They used it to justify slavery over the years. And this is what happens so often in Scripture where people just reach in and they pull out what they want to find. There's that nickel word, epistemology which means you have a foregone conclusion when you open the Bible and you're only opening it to see if you can find something that proves your thought. And that's what people, oh, this is a curse. And, and the black folks come from there, so they have to be slaves. I'll tell you, people just do not study the Word of God. So it's obvious that the prophecy applies here. It doesn't apply only to the Africans, the black ones there, but also to other descendants of Ham, most of which are not black. And no more of the uh, Hamitic peoples have experienced such servitude during their, their history uh, than the non Hamitic peoples. I mean, it's, servitude happens everywhere. Slavery happens everywhere. You look at the Roman Empire, did you know that there were more slaves in Rome than there were free people? 
So, I mean, slavery happens. When you try to justify it, that's different. If servant of servant does not mean lowest slave, then what does it mean? Here's, you see, sometimes you have to work a little bit. You have to do a little study, a little research. Although the word servant is frequently used in the Old Testament, this is the only place where servant of servants occurs. In the next two verses, Noah predicted that Canaan would be both servant to Shem and servant to Japheth. In other words, the nations that descended from Ham would be servants not only to one other nation or one other group of nations, but to all nations. But it doesn't say slave. You know, this unique and worldwide service is something different. And it's probably part of what was meant here by the superlative servant of servants. It might be objected that uh, Hermetic, Hermetic people never have been under worldwide subjection to the, to the Japhon's uh, descendants or Shem's descendants. Neither for that matter have the Canaanites alone been slaves. The answer to this objection and it may be noted that a servant is not necessarily a slave. In fact, the word is used more often to refer to a position of steward. And steward is an honorable position in a household rather than one slave. The fact that this is the first mention of the word servant in the Bible, we have a lot of firsts in Genesis, uh, is important because as such, this term has undoubtedly a special significance. When we see the first of something, it's special, isn't it? So there's something special here. In a sense, it could be prophetic of Christ, who was the fullest degree made a servant of servants for all the world, bearing curse for us. Listen to Philippians 2, 6 through 8. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion of man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He was a servant, not a slave. And the servant here does a great service for us, doesn't he? He went to the cross, died for us. He was a servant. The greatest of man's responsibilities was to fill the earth, not only with physical descendants, but what? With the knowledge of the Lord. Isaiah 11 at 9 tells us that, Habakkuk 2, 14, and today it hasn't changed. Today we still have a mission to fill the world with the knowledge of the Lord. How do we do that today? Look around at your flags. Missions. We can't go to Africa. We can't go to North or South America. We can't go to those countries, but we can send missionaries with the knowledge of the Lord. So he, he's called upon, called upon to teach all to call upon the name of the Lord, preserving and transmitting the promises of God until the, the coming of the world's Redeemer. There's a job here to be done. Mankind has three fundamental types of duties to perform as God's stewards over the world. First is spiritual. Receiving, preserving, teaching the knowledge of the Word of God. Secondly, it's intellectual. Expanding and teaching the knowledge of the Word of God. And thirdly, it's physical. Providing the material means for man's bodily needs and comforts, thus enabling him to do what? Fulfill his intellectual and spiritual functions more effectively. Every part of man has one duty to get the word of God out. To make you know, the knowledge of the Lord. Somehow we've lost that over the years. And these three duties correspond to the threefold makeup of our nature, isn't it? Spirit, soul, and body. Some person has to, to some degree, if some people do, uh, all three capacities, but in each of us, one usually dominates. Spiritual, intellectual, physical. Say uh, the same generalization applies to nations, by the way. Some have historically been primarily motivated by religious considerations. For example, Israel 
was supposed to be a theocracy ruled by God. They were to be a religious nation. Some are philosophical. Some are scientific in their thinking. And others are materialistic. Practical, if you will, in their pursuits. It's therefore, I think, significant that these first three ancestors of the modern nations were recognized by their father to have characteristics represented excuse me, in these three categories. Shem mainly was motivated by spiritual conscience. Japheth by intelligence and Ham was physical. The same was true in a very general, general way of course of the nations which descended from them. By the reasons of both generic inheritance and parental example, uh, each was regarded as God's servant. All right? Shem in spiritual service, Japheth in intelligent service, Ham responsible for physical service, and as such was a servant of servants. You see, it? if Shem is a servant of God spiritually, and then Japheth is a servant of God intellectually. Ham's physical inventions and these different things, he was serving the other servants. He would provide them the physical means, food, clothing, shelter, weapons, machinery, transportation, technological inventions, and equipment of all kinds, which would enable his brothers to carry out their spiritual and emotional and mental responsibilities toward mankind and toward God. In this way, Ham would be also serving God, wouldn't he? He is serving God by serving his brothers who are serving God. Again, there are no small jobs for God. Service for God is, is not something that be taken lightly. And there are no small jobs. Since Ham would be concerned more directly than others with the uh, ground which the Lord had cursed back in 529, the great curse is going to be felt more directly by Ham's descendants than by the others. In this sense, the uh, Hamanic responsibility was itself a curse, even though his duties were absolutely necessary for the accomplishment of God's purposes to mankind. This prediction by Noah was a spirit-inspired prophecy, not a curse because of his resentment for what had happened. And it's appropriate to the nature of Ham and his sons, and is shown to be mainly their physical consideration. God does not make mistakes. He didn't make one here. Assuming we can identify fairly well the Semite nations, which would be, of course, Israel, the Arabs, Syrians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, and the Japheth nations as uh, the Indo-Europeans, then by process of elimination, all the other nations are of Ham. The Hamites in general have been largely concerned with either uh, science, philosophy, you know, philosophy, theology, and had been occupied largely with uh, material pursuits. They were un I'm sorry, they were unconcerned with the other things. Mostly physical pursuits. They've been the great inventors and a lot of technology has come from them, as well as hard labor on farms and uh, hard fighters in battle. The descendants of Ham included the Egyptians, who of course were a great empire there and as well as nations like the Phoenicians, the Hittites, the Canaanites, the modern African tribes, the Mongol tribes, which include China and, and Japan and those today, as well as the American India and the South Sea Islanders, are probably from Ham. And as you look at these things, it makes sense, doesn't it? Talk about technology. Where do we get most of it? Japan. Isn't that in there? Fighters from that area, and farming and things that go on. So among the many ways which the uh, Hamites have been great servants of mankind are, are the following here. They are the original explorers and settlers, 
practically in all parts of the earth following the dispersion from Babel. You know, God kind of had to get a switch after them, well, as we'll see, to get them to do what they need to do. Secondly, they were the first uh, cultivators of most of the basic food groups of the world, such as being Southerners, potatoes and beans and corn and cereal, that sort of thing. And they were the first to domesticate animals. They developed most of the uh, types of structural forms and uh, building tools and materials. They were the first to develop unusual fabrics for clothing and various sewing and weaving devices. They discovered and invented a wide variety of medicine, and surgical practices, and instruments. They invented most of the concepts of basic practical mathematics as well as surveying and navigation. The machinery of commerce and trade, money, banks, postal systems, and all that developed by them. They developed paper and ink, block printing, movable type, and all that kind of things. So if one traces far enough back, you will see that practically every basic device and system needed for man's physical substance and convenience originated from genetic Today, they've been the servants of mankind in a very amazing way, haven't they? It has the, pro has the prophecy also has an first side to it also. They usually uh, have been able to go only so far with their explorations and inventions and no farther. It always reminds me that God's in control. They went so far with it. The descendants of Japheth and Shem uh, have sooner or later taken over their territories, their inventions, and developed and utilized them for their own advantage in accomplishing their own service to mankind. Sometimes the Hamites, especially the black race, have become actual slaves to others and are possessed of a genetic character concerned mainly with mundane, practical matters. The descendants here have often eventually been displaced by intellectual and philosophical shrewdness of his other brother's lines there, both that and with the religious zeal of the Semites. These are very general and broad national and, and racial characteristics. Yeah, there's, uh, a lot of it is part of individual generic basis. It's obvious, though, that the divine description here of future facts in no way needs you know, the assistance of the Semites or Jacob's line for the accomplishment. You know, one thing we have to mention, well, it's not quite the same now, but one of the things that's different over all these years is intermarriage, one line with the other. And so some of that generic characteristics is now found in every line. So you may have part of Ham's line that are more religious. Some may be more intelligent. And you may find some of the Semites who are more practical. But that comes from all the years where they're joined together. And verse 26, and he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem and Canaan shall be his servant. So having predicted Ham's primary relationship to the cursed ground along with his material responsibility to mankind, Noah turns his attention to his next son, Shem. Not only by his action of sonly respect. You know, respect is a wonderful thing. You want somebody to respect you, you respect them. If somebody disrespects you, you don't have much respect for them, but Shem respected his father. But it was also the character of his life that Noah had observed. As Shem had long indicated a love for the Lord God and his faith in God's promises. That has to be obvious here by the, the blessing. So Noah knew, therefore, that God's special blessing would especially rest on him. So he exclaimed, Blessed be the Lord. Notice in your Bibles, it's all capitals. When you see the Lord in all capitals in the Old Testament, what does it mean? Jehovah. 
or we find out later, I am. That's what it means. If it's got a, if it's not all caps, it's a different meaning there, different name. In this case, it's Jehovah. Shem knew the Lord personally. I think that's why the term is used here, Jehovah. And he had a covenant relationship. He knew him by that name. This strongly implies, even though it's not expressly stated, that it was through Shem that God's greatest blessing to the world would come. The promised seed of the woman. He's coming. So this also means that the devil has another guideline. We've talked about this before. From the time that the Lord made that prophecy, from the seed of the woman, the woman's seed, Satan was attempting to destroy that lie. That's why Cain killed Abel. The devil thought that that might be the lie. And so it's been persecution. Now, he knows, again, of the three brothers. Satan, I think, from this, this prophecy, he says, that's the lie. And it is. The Semites. And Cain was going to be a servant who was going to help him accomplish this. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. Finally, he comes to his oldest son. He prophesies that he would be enlarged, and that the Hamites would be of service to him in this faction. The Hebrew word used here is not the usual word for enlarged, uh, and it's, it's translated in this one instance, by the way. It apparently does not refer to geological enlargement. He's not talking about he's going to have his home's going to be the size of Texas. No, he's not talking like that. Uh, there's a different Hebrew word there. And then you want to refer to that. This word is usually translated entice or persuade. In a particular form in this verse, it occurs only once. And in most translators are unanimous that it should be translated be enlarged. It apparently derived from the word to make open in the Hebrew. It means most probably putting all this together that the thought here is one of mental enlargement. And he's what's going to be intellectual. If uh, one is persuaded or enticed, his previous opinions have been altered. He changes his mind or what? He has opened his mind. You know, if you want to be intelligent, you have to have an open mind. You know, some people are so close. Japheth was an open-minded man, so would his descendants be. So the lion would be intellectually curious, explorers of the world of thought, and Ham would, that's just as Ham would be in the physical world, going out there looking at new lands. And as Shem would be spiritual. Not only would he be intellectually enlarged, he would also dwell in the tents of Shem. Now, this is a figure of speech that means having fellowship with. It doesn't mean that he's going to say, hey, brother, I'm here. Move over. What's for dinner? That's not what he's talking about. Of course, being brothers, they probably shared some meals, but this means he's having fellowship with him. It's the very same meaning and opposite as over in Psalm 94.10 where it says, dwell in the tents of wickedness. That means they live in wickedness out of the fellowship of God. These figures of speech are important. Jacob would not literally live in those same tents. It's also the same word, tabernacle. We know about the tabernacle. It's the same word used for the, what the Bedouins would sleep in, what we'll find that Abraham carried within tents tabernacles. And eventually the tabernacle that was built when Moses was given the charge at Sinai. So Shem would be the means of mankind receiving God's great spiritual promises. And Japheth also would be appropriate, appropriate these blessings to himself by enjoying that fellowship with him. That's a wonderful thought, isn't it? He's going to have the intelligent thought about having fellowship with the one who is the most spiritual, what's going to happen? He is going to be led to the Lord more. He's going to have a closer relationship. 
That's what happens when you come around people who love the Lord. When you gather together with believers, it's a wonderful thing. And you're drawn closer. When someone comes in who's unsaved and around believers and they're under the Word, eventually the Lord's going to get hold of them. And that's what's going to happen here. I think it's great to see that. And Shannon and Japheth had united, uh, united and shown to respect their father in the way they treated him by backing in, not observing his nakedness and covering him up. They would be unified in worship of the Lord God of Shem. The Hamites, on the other hand, and by implication, would not do so. But they would probably follow other gods of their own devising, which we've seen over and over again. If you're not in the Word, if you're not, in this case, if they work with someone spiritually minded, someone who's going to give them the knowledge of the Lord, they're going to fall away. But man always is seeking a God. Have you ever noticed that? I have never met a real atheist. I've heard people say they're atheists, but they worship something. Something is their God. I don't care if it's a dollar bill or a car, they have a God. They made an idol. Anyway, Sam, Sam Ham's service would contribute to the purpose of the true God for all men. And Noah's threefold, threefold prophecy has been abundantly fulfilled in general and in principle throughout history. And it allows for individual exceptions. That is, a particular descendant of Ham may be very spiritual minded and become fruitful servant of the true God. A particular descendant of Japheth may be dull of mind while being skilled in technological things. Another son of Shem might not follow the Lord and be interested in another thing. He may be claimed to be an atheist. People have choices and people make decisions. And they become these decisions to go the other way and away from the, the family line and, and the national characteristic, as I said, becomes greater with intermarriage because it, the change of thought takes place, it's the change of attitude. So the Japheth, uh, especially the Greeks, the Romans, the later Egyptians, and Americans, have stressed science and philosophy in their development. The Semites have been dominated by religious motivations. You see, centered in monotheism, the Jews and the Arab or the Muslims later on. The Hamites, the Egyptians, the Phoenicians, the Orientals, the Africans, etc., great pioneers, opened up the world to settlement, cultivation, technology. Each stream of nations is influenced by the other. There's been a mixing of people, different tribes and nations. And there are exceptions to the general trends. Note the three streams that we talk about here are not races. You know, who can find the word race in the Bible, anybody? You won't find it there. God does not talk about races. You know, some have thought that uh, the Semites, the, the descendants of Japheth, the Hamites, are three separate races. That is, the dusty, the white, the black races, or the Mongols, the Mongolians, the Caucasians, the Negroids. But the Bible teach, it doesn't teach that. Nor does modern anthropology. And what it, science has to agree with the Bible, whether it wants to or not. Well, human genetics doesn't teach that. There are dusty and black people found among all three groups. The Bible does not use the word race, nor does it acknowledge such a concept. We're all one from one descendant. The modern concept of race. Anybody know where it comes from? Give you one guess, anybody? Evolutionary teaching. The evolutionists want you to think it came from different places and different thinking. And the evolutionists, they, they race, uh, is a race to subspecies in the process of evolving into a new species and the idea is based on modern racism. You see, they're looking for a missing link. There is no missing link. The actual origin of the descendants of Shem and Ham and Japheth 
are identified as we get into chapter 10. And I don't know if I can even finish the last two verses here. Let me see if I can. I'm going to try anyway. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. And all the days of Noah were 950 years. And he died. These verses conclude chapter 9, Genesis, as well as the story of Noah. You know, for such a major event, not a lot of time is dedicated to it. As in a lot of scripture, it's very brief, but it's concise. We're going to get into Genesis now, into longer stretch, where the Lord is going to spend more time with Abraham and with Joseph because of the story there. It's important. But Noah himself, you notice, was not greatly affected by the change of atmospheric conditions after the flood, as his descendants were. He lived another 350 years after the flood. He died at the age of 950. That's longer than any of his ancestors except Jared, who was 962, and some old fellow named Methuselah, who was 969. If there are no gaps in the genealogical list there in chapter 11, this means Noah continued living until Abraham was about 58 years old. On the other hand, as we'll, we might talk about in chapter 11, there's a possibility of gaps in there. So we really don't know. It's likely that Noah lived after the dispersion, at least after the dispersion at Babel. But if we're really important, you know what? <coughs> The Lord will have told us. So we'll stop there. I did think about 7:30, and Lord willing, we'll pick up next week. But we'll be kind of just breezing over. You cut it off. Breezing over chapter 11.